on today's episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. You find the greatest warriors, the Spartans, the Samurai, the Aztecs, the Apache, U.S. military, and I think even you could say the Christian martyrs who are mm -hmm. warriors for their faith. What do they have in common? Two things. They know what they believe, and they're willing to die for it. Well, I was a fanatic. There's no doubt a fanatic. My goal was to get carried out of the wrestling room because of exhaustion, and it never happened. The thing it did for me every day about 6 o'clock is that when I got out, I looked back in and there was nobody else there. Bottom line was, I didn't reach my goal. So guess what happened? I went back in the room again. But I got some quality time because of just some kind of a fanatic goal. Hey guys, welcome back to Wrestling Changed My Life. Today's guest is Gene Zanetti. Gene graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with degrees in both clinical and sports psychology. And he founded a company called Wrestling Mindset, which is the focus of our conversation today. You know, I'm fascinated by the mental side of the game. You know, what techniques do world-class performers use to get the most out of themselves between the ears up top? So that's really what this whole conversation is about. And so even if you're not a wrestling fan, you'll be able to take something away from this, some technique or skill that's going to improve the way you think about the mind and hopefully improve your day-to-day. -day. So I hope you enjoy this one. As always, if you enjoy the show, give us a review on iTunes, subscribe to the show, and go to wrestlingchangemylife.org to check out past episodes. Now sit back and enjoy this show with Gene Zanetti. Let's just start with a quick background on the business you started, Wrestling Mindset. What is it about, um, and what are some of the things you guys are working on? Yeah, so I started wrestling in third grade right through college, wrestling high school, college. I coached as an assistant coach over at Springfield College where I was doing my master's degree. Okay. Both of my younger brothers wrestled. It's kind of like with, um, it's a family sport. So my dad wrestled, wasn't very good, but he loved it. He caught that bug when he was in high school. So then when I was two, even before I signed up for wrestling, he would wrestle around with me and yeah. kind of became a family sport. Both of my younger brothers, it became a love, a passion. I also, I also played football at the time. I, I played um, baseball, played soccer a little bit when I was a kid. You know, you do the kid thing. You play a little bit of everything. Yep. But as time went on, being a hyperactive kid who couldn't sit still, and wrestling was really what I gravitated to the most. Yep. And you have the most control. There wasn't, in, in Little League or rec sports, politics. If your dad's the coach, you play. That kind of thing, even if you might be better than the kid. And what I liked about wrestling is that if you know you work hard, you push yourself, you, you can beat the coach's son. It doesn't yep. matter. You don't have to be you don't have to be related to anyone. If you're a lot better, you'll beat the guy. Exactly. So and that's so where that started. You, how did you take that into this business? And what's the business about that you're running now? Yeah, so basically my whole life was really about how do I bring out my best and how do I bring out my brother's best? I was always like a mentoring older brother. Mm -hmm. And again, technique. Strength training. I became, I became a personal trainer for a little while. I was a sports nutritionist for a little while. And it's just really, how do I get as much out of myself as I can? How do I get as much out of my brothers as I, as I can? And so having that mentoring personality helped. I read a book called Fight Your Fears and Win when I was a senior in high school. And that's what really made me want to go into sports psychology. I took a psychology elective. And I didn't know, it, like most seniors in high school, didn't know what I wanted to do. Took an elective of accounting and psychology because it was interesting. My dad's an accountant. So I figured, well, maybe I'll be like my dad and be an accountant. Right. Took that class, hated it. That was out. <laughs> but, it, but I had like an epiphany day in one of my psychology classes. I was like the mediator between like a couple's dispute, a mm -hmm. fake, you know, yeah. a, a mock thing. And I remember, and it was like a total disaster. But I remember at that moment, I said, if they were taking this serious, I could have really helped them with this problem. Right. And it was just kind of like, I remember the class almost being like in slow motion, everyone leaving. And I'm like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be a psychologist. Then I read that book, Fight Your Fears and Win by Dr. Don Green, realized there was a profession called sports psychology. And I said, man, that's what I want to do. So kind of like psychology, and then a few months later, sports psychology. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to Rutgers University, was wrestling over there, yep. had everything lined up to be a psychology major. My sophomore, year of high uh, my sophomore year of college, one of my teammates recommended I read a book by Robert Kiyosaki called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And when I read that book, it was talking about the, um, you know, the benefits of being an entrepreneur and a business owner and how it's just a totally different mindset than what most people have, where you go to school, you get a safe, secure job. Yep. This was talking about financial freedom and how you could pave your own way. Kind of like my wrestling career, where it was different than other sports. You're not reliant on teammates. You're not you, know, you could have a bad game. You could have a great game, and your teammates could have a bad game. 
you know, it doesn't, it's a, it's a different thing. Or the coach doesn't play you. There's more politics involved. It was the same thing. It was more of like an individual sport, being an entrepreneur and business owner. You know, your fate's in your hands. It really appealed to me. And at that moment, I said, now I want to own a business. I wanted to own a sports psychology business. So it's like God led me this way over small, like over time. Yeah. Psychology, um, sp sports psychology, and then owning a business in sports psychology. So that was kind of like the transition. Okay. All right, so three years into Rutgers, I wound up transferring to the University of Pennsylvania. I had an opportunity to go Ivy League. I was a junior at the time at Rutgers, and my brother was a freshman at Penn. He was one of the, uh, one of the top recruits in the country. So he got into the University of Pennsylvania right out of, right out of high school. I was at Rutgers, and I wound up beating the Penn guy twice during the season. And so the coach brought me in over there to Penn. I had an opportunity to go Ivy League. I enjoyed Rutgers, loved it. Right. And I said, why don't, you know, Ivy League, you don't get this opportunity, you know, very often. So I took it. So I went to Penn, got my degree there. They had the number three undergrad psychology program in the country. That was great. My brother was taking classes at the Wharton School of Business, sure. you know, that's number one business school in the country. Sure. So I wound up getting, so that, that wound up finishing up. We were teammates, we wrestled together, that was great. Then I went to Springfield College in Massachusetts to pursue my master's degree in exercise science sports psychology. Yep. Did that, then wound up getting a second master's degree at Montclair State University as, school psychology, as a school psychologist, became a certified school psychologist in the state of New Jersey. And yeah, and I got my clinical psychology master's degree. Okay. And all that while as a personal trainer and, and nutritionist. So it's like we have the body, like we're trying to, we have the body kind of figured out. Yep. And now it's like getting the mind figured out to really maximize everything, right? And so th that, that's really, that's how it really went down. At, during my master's degree programs, I started taking clients individually. There was a sports psychologist at Montclair State, Dr. Rob Gilbert. Every day he has a success hotline, leaving a three and a half minute message on a motivational story or quotes. Who is that? What's that guy? Dr. Rob Gilbert. Okay. Yeah, you're going to want to call that every day. I think now he's going to gear. He's going to start gearing more towards podcasts. But he was a guy who was really instrumental in, in in my life with that. And he said you could start doing this right now. And he told me you could work with athletes, not just in person, but on the phone. Wow. So that kind of like over time, I was learning more and more what to do. And he connected me with certain people, other sports psychologists who do who have a practice on the phone. So wow. isn't it crazy yeah. just the merging of influences that you had throughout your life and how you really never oh, yeah. know the path and you, you just got to keep an open mind and, and stay positive throughout it. Yeah. Good things happen. Yeah. Just trusting the fact that God has a plan for your life, yeah. but not just leaning back on that and saying, oh, well, it'll just happen. Like taking active steps and trying things and certain things wind up falling through. Like you're on a certain path and maybe you get derailed and then you push forward. Yeah. So it's, it, it's really amazing how that happened. Actually, one of the interesting things was after Springfield, I left out a piece of the story. Okay. After Springfield, Field College. I got into LaSalle University to go for my doctorate in clinical psychology. Okay. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a sports psychologist yep. and then have my own practice, that kind of thing. Well, a year and a half into the program, I wound up getting a C in statistics. You can't get a C in statistics in a doctoral program. So I had to retake the class. You have to get at least a B minus. Second time around, I got the B minus, but the criteria bumps up to a B. So I got dropped from the program. 45 doctoral credits. I was doing well in my counseling classes and all that stuff, but statistics. Yeah fell through. So now it's like, well, what do I do with my life? And that's when I got, that's when I got that degree. I went to Montclair State, closer to home in New Jersey, yep. became a school psychologist just as like a temporary, I'll do this in the meantime, while we build the empire on the side, me yep. and my brother. And then we got to a certain point where while I was a school psychologist, Jeff was a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch. We said, okay, now we're, we're either going to go all in or, you know, what, what are we doing? Are we going all in or are we just going to do this part time? And, and we got to, we both left our jobs. Our parents were like, what are you doing? You have Ivy League degrees. You go to school, you get a safe, secure job. No one in my family was an entrepreneur. So they were scared, but at the same time, very supportive. Right. But still, they were like, what are you guys doing? Thinking it was a mistake and everything. Is your family and, old school blue collar? Like, are they, because uh, uh, like my family, you know, it's the same thing where, no one went to college. My brother and I were the first people to go to college. And, you know, they think that you got a mate, right? You've got a job. You got, we both got really good degrees. And, and so it's just, there's a different mindset starting with kind of your generation probably to now where um, starting a business on your own is something foreign to them. But it, it seems more natural to, I don't know why, it just seems more natural now. It was just, I guess, with the, the industrial revolution right, and, and everything, and people had jobs, there were jobs lined up. And then like our parents' generation, it's like, that was, a, that was good advice. You get a safe, secure job, you have, the, you have the benefits, you have a retirement plan. And like now, it's just, especially with the baby boomers entering retirement, you, you yeah. start to realize the future is pretty uncertain and we're gonna have to kind of fend for ourselves out there. Yeah. 
But the benefit is there's a lot of information about entrepreneurships that our, that our families in the past didn't necessarily have access to. Right. So there's a way to do it as long as you're being smart about it. And you know, thank God for my brother that we were able to start this together we formalized the business because he was back his background was financials you know all the so all the back office all the marketing all those like little tedious things that i have no desire to do at all he does all of that so that's why anytime you see emails from us social media campaign that's all him okay the money i don't even like to see the checks <laughs> i'll do, i'll make calls i'll yeah. do sales calls i'll do presentations but i don't really care to see the money that's all him Got it. he has no desire to develop the curriculum I love developing curriculum. He has no desire to speak in front of groups. I love doing that. Yep. So it's our, our passions kind of, we complement one another, which was a big blessing. And we always got along really well. So me, awesome. me and Jeff were always best friends growing up. And our youngest brother too. He's he four years younger than Jeff. So okay. there's a little bit more of an age gap. He's actually studying now to be a priest. He's in Rome. Wow. So he's, um, yeah, he started amazing. off at Seton Hall in New Jersey for three years. Now he has another three years left to go. So he's in Rome at the, at the North American College. So wow. it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's I like an Ivy League school for like priests, basically. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I love hearing about um, families where the brothers are close. My yeah. brother's 13 months younger than me. We grew up wrestling. Had a wrestling room in our basement. Best friends. We live about 11 blocks away from each other now in Chicago. So that's it's, awesome. It's just cool to hear that you guys uh, uh, kind of have that family business as well. Uh, that's huge. I, you know, you could trust your family, and again, and again you just. Oh, you're always together. It's it's a beautiful thing. Like my brothers, they're they're everything to me, and that's yeah. I, that's what always it kind of bonded us together in wrestling, and then eventually in business. Right. Yeah. So I do want to get into the curriculum, but one thing you mentioned that I'd love to go back to is when you were in your doctorate program, you ultimately got dropped from it. Yeah. How, what was that like? Was there moments of self doubt and you know concern? Then ultimately, you look at the obstacle and you went past it. But t take us through that because that had to be a pretty life changing event. Um, yeah, to say the, to say the least, it was two days before Christmas, and I get an email from the from the school saying that you know <laughs> you're dishonorably discharged. Basically, they you know you got the you couldn't you didn't make the grade that you're you're out. And oh, I was I was devastated. I cried like heck. Like it yeah. was it was really upsetting at the time. And I remember for the for like one of the first basically since high school, the first time I started saying like, what am I going to do with my life? How I mean, scary I, is that feeling? I, really scary. I mean, I knew I I, I always had the sense that everything was going to be okay, and I think that was rooted in my faith and my great family support. So I knew everything would be all right. But still, now it's like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, you can't just come out with a sports psychology master's degree and, and like, you know, you're, there's, unless you're going to, unless you have a clear plan, there's nothing you can do with that on your own. I mean, I was a personal trainer at the time. Yep. I was a nutritionist, but like, again, just basically peanuts. Yeah. Now I wasn't even making ends meet. I was still living with my parents. Right. So it's like, what am I going to do? So then applied to other doctoral programs, but I realized only nine credits would have transferred. You have 45 credits in the bank and now only nine credits are going to cre transfer if I get into a new doctoral program. So it's a lot of money lost. It'd be a lot of time lost. So I said, I have to, I have to root change. Wow. Well, I have a degree in psychology. What else can I do? So he said, well, schools, what about school psychology? So I became a school psychologist. You know, it's like, if you can't get, if you can't get what you, what you want, you get the next best thing. I think Jordan Burrow spoke about that, or uh, yeah, they all, everyone talks Brands about, talks that. about oh, that. Yeah, Brands too. talks about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, you can't get it, you get the next best thing. And you know that would be a very impactful job being a school psychologist. Yeah, because those kids are a lot of times, even if they have parents at home, sometimes they're not that close with them, or they don't feel connected, or if they don't have parents at home, God forbid, you know. So it's it's true. So um, and so you guys ultimately started the business. How long were you doing it on the side for until you went full time? It was 2008 when we started, when I started taking people, and then uh, full-time 2013. So was it come out to five years? That's a long time. You're my brother, the math yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my brother's an accountant, so it's funny you say that. There it that. is. Um, that's a long time, though, to, yeah. uh, to do it. And you put in the time, you put in the work. What did you learn over those first five years that you're using now when you went full-time with it? Because that's something where I don't think a lot of people would put in that time without seeing uh, – you seeing the fruits of their labor. Maybe you were seeing the fruits of your labor, but I was I had clients on the side. Yep. There were certain teams I was working with. Right. I'd go and I'd give like one off presentations. Yep. And at the time also while I was a personal trainer, my brother Jeff and I, we started a different business called Z Fanatical Fitness. We were helping everyone. We wanted to make like a P ninety X or insanity campaign for Beachbody. Nice. And we were in different gyms. So like we were we were focusing on I had my clients on the side for mindset training. I had my teams, but we started with um businesses uh, with um fitness. We were running group fitness 
fitness classes, different stuff like that. We basically made um, 10 workouts, 10 minutes, and no equipment. So basically like the no excuse workout. Nice. We wanted to make like a three-dimensional fitness program, like P90X and Insanity. They have an exercise plan. They have a nutrition plan. Yep. Which in the past generation, like Tybo or Sweat into the Oldies, Richard Simmons, that yeah. stuff, it was just an exercise plan. Okay. So that was one-dimensional fitness. P90X and Insanity launch, launched exercise and nutrition, two-dimensional fitness. We wanted to be the first three-dimensional fitness program, exercise, nutrition, and mindset. Got it. Because that was my background. So it was like it was make the Z, exercise, nutrition, and then the missing link between the two is the, the crossbar and the Z, mindset. Okay. So we were running those workouts and everything like that. That was going on. We wound up partnering with um, EFT, a business that it, that's, uh, works at Retro Fitness, which okay. is uh, one of the big gyms in the Northeast region. Nice. So we were learning a lot. I bring that up because we were learning a lot about business at that time. And even though we didn't have a lot of control there, it was kind of like we had to, we were limited by how much they wanted to incorporate us. But all the while, we were learning how to how to build people, how to sell the program, like all like the infrastructure. We were learning that stuff at the time, so that wound up being like kind of a little like a minor failure. We, yes. I mean, not really. We were making money, but we just weren't growing at enough at a steady enough rate where we would have been able to leave our jobs. Right. So we learned those lessons. I was taking those clients and basically realized that if we wanted to really make this into a career and, f and a business in terms of like financial freedom, we have to be able to scale. At the time I was taking, I was doing all the services. I was uh, providing 100% of the individual coaching, 100% of the team coaching. We need to be able to train other people how to do this. Yeah. So I put together that curriculum that we have over there of different worksheets, different worksheets and mindset exercises. So now it's like, okay, we have a systematic program how do I become more confident? How do I relax under pressure? How do I build mental toughness? Right, we're just on the Joe Rogan podcast with Ben Askren where he spoke where he spoke about where Joe Rogan was saying there's no program out there that teaches you how to think. Right. And that's what I kind of intuited a ways back. So right. so we How we awesome put, was that for you guys? Oh, it was great. Oh. It was a great chat. We weren't expecting it. I love Joe Rogan, first of all, huge fan big fan of Ben Askren and that podcast was awesome but then they gave you a plug and I've known about you guys long before but that was just awesome yeah. um did the website see a spike from that from oh that sure mention? and especially with with martial arts mindset so thankfully what we what we've been doing in the past like the past year has been expansion into other sports yep so we had a formal mixed martial arts uh, martial arts mindset program so more people obviously in the martial arts world but Joe Rogan and Ben Askren started coming into the program so definitely Got spike it. things with that exciting yeah yeah so so let's talk good. about the actual what you do with an athlete so maybe to start with what are some of the the pitfalls that you see and we're going to focus on wrestlers for a little bit but this applies to anyone um i'm in sales and i know sales is a, is a mental warfare game so i'm going to use a lot of this for my life but let's start with wrestlers what are some of the pitfalls you see and and how are you addressing them through the program here yeah, and funny you say with sales. Cause we made a sales mindset curriculum also because we realized these principles are really for your whole life. Yes. And I always tell the teams and the individuals that this has to be a vehicle to improve your life. If all you get out of this is wrestling, you miss the boat. Yep. Right? Because like I still have really good technique. I wrestled in college, right? I was ranked in the country. Right. But I don't use my technique anymore. Right. Same thing with lifting weights. Yeah, I want to be like... I still want to be strong. You know, you want to be jacked and tan, look good for the beach yeah. in New Jersey. That's an important <laughs> thing. Right? But, but, that, but that being said... That I'm not, I'm not really doing anything. It's not. I'm not making money. I'm not paying the bills with my strength. Right. But the mindset that you get in wrestling, you could apply to the rest of your life. And what do you think that so, is? What are some of the biggest takeaways that wrestling gives you? Really, building confidence, your mental toughness, your ability to relax under pressure, knowing what to focus on and what not to focus on. And unfortunately, most people didn't teach that. That right. wasn't. That wasn't out there. Like in high school, we did not hear about that at all. About right. the mindset, even though. We were struggling with a lot of the things, everything really that we see youth athletes right through the Olympic team, what they struggle with. And we work with the Olympic team, we work with, you know, UFC fighters and they struggle with the same things. Choking in big competitions, underperforming. We call them the mindset red flags. Okay. Choking in big matches, underperforming, giving good opponents too much respect. If you know you're going against the guy who's ranked third in the state, it's in the back of your mind, yep. right? Um, being a slow starter. How many athletes we see, if they would have just competed in the first period, the way they did in the second or third period, they could have beat that guy. Yeah. And really that applies to any sport. Right. Being a slow starter, so that, that's a big thing we see. Feeling burnt out over the course of a long season. Sure. Not being able to bounce back from mistakes. Yeah. Right. It's like you could train your butt off in like hours and months and years of training. And if you're not, and if you, and if you get mentally derailed in a moment of adversity, you just waste it. Like, it's like all that training will almost be like nothing. 
you know, you'll lose to someone who you're much better than yep. and you'll be a practice room wrestler. So that's one of the other things we see. If you could do it in practice, but not in a competition, that's 100% mental. There's no reason you can't do it in a competition. If you could do it in practice, it's the same thing. It's just live wrestling. Right. So, you know, so it doesn't make a difference. We could have this conversation very, very easily right now. If we're on national TV, we know this is going to be on whatever, Fox, NBC, whatever. It's like, if we can't do the same thing, that's that's a mental thing. Hundred yeah. percent, because we're doing it now. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> and isn't it amazing how we look at and idolize people, whether it's a, a Conor McGregor, a John Jones, or, or TJ Dillashaw, those are some of my favorite UFC fighters. We think those people are flawless, and we think that they never have self doubts. But reality is, everyone probably has self doubts. It's just how they manage them and, and dwell on them, or don't dwell on them. You that's, know? that's right. And that's why I say you have to have heroes. You have to have role models. One of the things we talk about for confidence is really what we are is we're giving people hope. And how do you get hope? By hearing other people's experiences. It's a good acronym, H-O-P-E, hear other people's experiences. Okay. And then the other cute little acronym is hold on, possibilities exist. Okay. So when you hear other people's experiences, you hold on, possibilities exist. Got it. That's getting hope, right? So a lot of the successful role models that I've looked to Always listen to interviews. Always watch that because that's where you learn about their mindset and what they were thinking. And my dad was real big on that as a kid. And we'd after a competition, we think it's over. My dad would be like, shh, listen. Like on TV, he'd want to hear the interview. And that's where we learned. We were able to find the common denominators between the field of sports psychology, top performers, right? What are they saying? Like, how are they speaking the same language? What's the commonalities? One of the things top performers say is read, read or watch one biography a month. Like, or listen, yep. listen to a great athlete, a great whoever, right. politician, business person, salesperson, anything, but one a month, either watch it or read it yep. because you need to see that they, everyone assumes it's the gifted birth, right? right? It, was the, it, right. Was the, it was the gifted birth because they, they were just a generic, a genetic freak. Right, like um, when that's we talk, very rarely the case, though. Yeah, almost no, it's never the case. Yeah, even and LeBron even if, had put in yeah. ten years of work before we even heard about him in middle school. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they have some raw skills. Like there's a real thing of genetics, sure. right? Some people do have natural raw skills, but if you're not, but if you're not putting in the time on top of it, you're going to get to a level where you plateau, and you're just not going to beat those people anymore because right. the talent's just not enough. Right. So you have to then know how to maximize what you have, and you got to be able to bounce back. Great thing I remember Jordan Burroughs saying when he spoke at a Pennsylvania wrestling camp. He said his he was a senior senior of high school, yep. state champ, freshman year of college. He had about a 500 record, and he actually said on record in front of probably 500 kids, he thought about quitting. Mm -hmm. He said to himself, "Maybe I'm not cut out for college wrestling." Yep. Jordan Burroughs, I know four five, four time world the best wrestler ever. Yeah, yeah. And and he thought maybe he's not cut out for college wrestling. Now what happens is most people they get to that moment and they quit, right? And th that's why we don't remember who they are. Yeah. <laughs> he goes on, not only becomes a two-time NCAA champ, but a world and Olympic champ. And, and you see that that becomes par for the course when you read biographies. Abraham Lincoln, his record for uh, like elections was like three and nine. Yeah. If you like look at it and it's like, it, yeah. I, tell, I tell people all the time, go through his successes and failures and you see it. And then all of a sudden, uh, named 16th president, that's um, elected 16th president. There it is. That's Abraham Lincoln. You yeah. know, you cover the name. Who is this person? You think, oh, he's, he's a political loser. Some no, dumb, yeah. he's one of the greatest presidents ever <laughs> right it's amazing how to your point that's those stories are pervasive where you you're you're on a path you maybe have some initial success then you hit a roadblock and the people that stop right before that i mean they're a dime a dozen and a lot of times just you just seem to go that next day or that next month and you're gonna get there you know yeah you don't the thing is we don't see the big picture and that's why i say faith is so important with with athletes yeah. and with people right we say what are what are the most the greatest warriors of all time so i love studying sports psychology yep. i love studying the top athletes and i love studying the top warriors like history right right what right. do they all have in common right and you find the greatest warriors the spartans the samurai the aztecs the patchy u.s military and I think even you could say the Christian martyrs who are mm -hmm. warriors for their faith, what do they have in common? Two things. They know what they believe and they're willing to die for it. Yeah. So how does that apply to sports? It's like they know what they believe and they're not afraid to lose or make mistakes. Like they're like, of course they hate losing. They want to succeed, but they realize their successes and failures don't define them. They're defined by what they believe. And that's why knowing your faith, knowing your morals, knowing your values is so important because if you're going into business and you don't know that faith and morals, you'll get pulled in every different direction. And even if, and even if you get very successful, which you see a lot of rock stars, movie stars, yeah. um, athletes, depression, suicide, substance abuse, because they don't know who they are. Right. Right. So if you know, and also a lot of people, they don't reach that level because they get, if they lose, they identify as I'm a loser. 
Right. Right. Abraham Lincoln, when he lost, he didn't identify as a loser. He knew who he was, so he was able to plow forward. So it's the same thing. Even when I fail out of the doctoral program, you know, fail out with a B minus, <laughs> you still, you still, um, you know who you are. Right. You don't. You might not know exactly what's going to happen. That's kind of speaking to the point we were saying here. You might not know exactly what's going to happen. I didn't know really. What am I going to do? Right. That was my dream. But I knew I wasn't going to quit. Right. And I knew that that doesn't define me. That doesn't make me a loser. If you have that. Now, all of a sudden, the, the loss is you're not as scared to lose or make mistakes because you're the same either way. And um, just to touch on that point a little bit, Anthony Ashnall, four-time uh, state champ in New Jersey, yep. and um, now several-time All-American at Rutgers, and then Jordan Burroughs before the Olympics. They asked them both before, Ashnall before his senior year state finals, Burroughs before the 2012 Olympics, what if you lose? And I, that was like a pretty pivotal question to me because they're asking, what if you lose? And I remember in high school, if someone asked me that, I don't even want to talk about it. Don't, don't, don't even about talk. It. But don't even yeah. think about losing to get yeah. that out of my head. And these guys were both like, well, you know, your parents are still going to love you. Your coaches are still going to coach you. You're going to be basically the same as before. They dealt with that mentally. So they weren't identifying as a success or failure based on, of course, they didn't want to lose. Of course, they wanted to win. But they weren't identifying as that. And that's what a lot of the top athletes are missing. They're attaching their identity to how much money they make, what kind of car do they drive, did they win or did they lose, what did they place in the tournament, what school did they go to, what was their grade in this class. Strive for all of that. We're all about maximizing success in those areas, but do not identify as that. Right. And I've heard uh, Tim Ferriss does this and John Jones also big on this. They even visualize what the the worst situation. Tim Ferriss. I got that lesson from him, and that's why we included that in our worksheet. Because, our worksheets, yeah. yeah, because you look at it and you go, all right, the worst thing that could happen is I lose this match. So what? You know, there are so much bigger things in life, but even taking it outside of wrestling, if this business fails, well, I still have my family. I still have my friends. Um, and it, you could just go on and on and on. But yeah, they even visualize it, which when I first read that, I go, that's crazy. I don't want to even have that thought in my head because I'm afraid of it. If you're afraid of it, you got to remove that fear. Yeah, you know? I, I love that lesson from Tim Ferriss. Yeah. That's why I incorporated that in our program because of that lesson. And I, and I qualify with the athletes too. Like I get it. We're not trying to negatively rehearse. We're not trying to mentally rehearse negative outcomes. Right. But it's important that we deal with that because then if you know you can deal with the worst case scenario, you're bulletproof. In, right. a, in a certain sense. Right. So that's why that. your, your identity is huge. And that's what a lot of people are missing. People identify with their successes and failures. Wrong. Your identity is independent of this. And we've all seen the Kyle Snyder video after the said July loss. It's one of the best videos I've ever seen. And it's maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. And he talks about how a win and loss doesn't define me. You know? Awesome. awesome. And it just goes to this concept of the internal scoreboard versus the external scoreboard. Right. right. Goals should be, you have to have the goals of the outcomes, things you don't control. National champ, start a business, take it public, whatever. Outcome goals, sure. Outcome goals, right. But the reality is that the internal scoreboard is really that all that matters, right? If you know you're being the best you can be at that particular time. Now, a lot of people don't know what it means to truly push as hard as they possibly can. But if you do push as hard as you can, mentally, physically, you've really won. And you've won the internal scoreboard, yeah. right? And so it shouldn't matter what happens on the outside. The reality is that it does. And I think why it matters is because we're worried what other people think about us. Exactly. It's like, what do you, th what do you tell kids who are worried about what other people think or worried about others' opinions? Because I think that's a very common uh, pitfall, both in sports and in life, caring what other people think about you. Do you guys talk about that at yeah, all? Yeah, we've basically built the program about that's That's one of the main things. Maybe it's because I myself tend to be more of a people pleaser. Like even as a kid, it was always, Same. you wanted your parents to say, oh, you know, Gene, he's such a good boy. You get that pat on the back, right? right. Or if you're having a bad day, it's like, oh man, you know, you, you kind of, you look at, you're looking for that pity from people. Right. So we basically built the business off, off that really. And in terms of like our main philosophies, that's like very relatable to people. One of our core messages, we talk about the predator prey mindset. Okay. Have you ever heard? Uh, heard I've heard you guys talk about it. Okay. It's on my list yeah. to, to drill into. So let's, let's, for someone who's never heard of it, hit them from the top and take us into it. Yeah. So basically you want to, you want to be able to say, so, say these things in a relatable way that's memorable to yep. the people, right? So I took an animal behavior class at Penn, didn't do too well, and I got a D in it actually. Okay. <laughs> but I did learn a lesson. I'm, I might be the only one applying those lessons right now. Okay. And we learned there's two types of animals in the animal kingdom, predator and prey. How can you tell the difference between a predator and prey animal just by looking at them? Some people say their teeth, some people say their size. No, it has to do with their eyes. Right, so predator animals, their eyes are on the front of their head. So you think lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my, right? yeah. where are their eyes located? Right. The front of their right. head. And why? Because they're focused on their goal. They're focused on what's in front of them. They're not looking around. So we say eyes on the front like to hunt. 
Okay. Then you look at prey. Then you look at prey animals: squirrels, chipmunks, rabbits. Where are their eyes located? On the front or on the side? And deer too, right? right. Around the side of their head. Why? Because they have to look out for the predator. They don't want to be. If the predator is looking for lunch, the prey doesn't want to be lunch. Right. 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 So the prey has to look around and see what's going on around them. Okay. Right. So we say, well, how does that apply to you as a person? And we we say, you know, open up your phone, put the camera facing you, look at yourself, look at your picture, where are your eyes located, identify your eyes. And they say their eyes are on the front of their head. Yeah. It's like, so what does that tell you? I remember I did this once with like an, a nine-year-old kid. He jumped out of his seat. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm a predator. And we're like, yes, ran over, gave him a high five. You know, Tony Robbins goes through the crowd and yes. gives people high fives. Yes. That's a big part of like my training too, learning a lot from, from Tony Robbins. But that's ran over, gave him a high five. It was great. But it's true. He's He identified we're predators. We're meant to be predators. That's an important lesson. So we can't act like prey. So now you apply that from the animal kingdom to your whole life. So eyes on the front like to hunt. We say as a predator, you have to focus on things within your control. Like we said, redefining success and failure, that's one of the lessons. We have redefining success, redefining failure, and redefining your attitude attitude towards mistakes. Mm -hmm. Right? So we look at like failure. There's no such thing as failure, only feedback. Okay. There's no losses, only learned lessons. Right? Okay. Those are like the, the corny catchphrases, which are great. We do want to live by those. But, you know, so going with that, we say predator. You're focusing on three things within your control, and this is sports, school, business, and life. Okay. Your effort, your attitude, and your aggressiveness. All three of those things are directly in your control. You could probably even uh, include aggressiveness under effort, yeah. but I like to make that a separate category intentionally because that's where people tend to hold back. Like You could go all out, but not necessarily take risks and take chances. Right. You'd be working as hard as you can in a job, but are you taking chances? Yep. So that's why I want to throw in aggressiveness. I make it its own category. So effort. Did I go all out or did I hold back? Yep. Make it black and white, very simple. Did you go all out or hold back in school while you're studying for a test, while you're running sprints, while you're in the match, yep. while you're whatever, on the sales call, giving a presentation. I've, I've talked about predator and prey, prey probably thousands of times right in the past you know, two years. Yeah. Okay, am I gonna go all out with this now or am I gonna hold back? That's my choice, right? So that, yeah. that's where we're at. I love a it. So that's effort. Okay. Attitude, did I stay positive the whole time? The whole time. Was I positive, yes or no? And positive thinking isn't just like kumbaya, hold hands, rainbows, and sunshine. Being a positive thinker is a difficult thing, right? It's not easy. You're having a, you're having a bad day. You lost a match. You, cut, you, have, you have to cut a few more pounds. You did bad on a test. Your teachers are coming down on you. Your parents are coming down on you. And just when you think things couldn't get any worse, you find out your girlfriend ran off with the drummer, right? You're having a, you're having right. a, you're you're having having a, a day. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> In those moments, can you still stay positive and say, yes, I understand. Like, we're not saying to deny reality. I'm struggling. This is a hard day for me. I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. Right. But I know I'm not going to quit. Like, it will be okay. It will work out. I still have good qualities. I'm still a son of God. Like, I can get through this. Yeah. Right. Other people have gotten through this before. That's a hard thing to do. It is. And like we talk about having word changes. Our, you know, our words are so important that we use because our words impact our thoughts. Thoughts back, impact behaviors. Your behavior impacts your destiny. But the starting point in the chain is the words we use. So we tell our athletes and really all people, stop using the words uh, um, stink, something stinks, something sucks. Yep. It's, it's under the category of like awfulizing. Nothing is awful, terrible, horrible, stinks, sucks. Right. You're damning a situation saying it's 100% bad. First of all, that's not only is it negative thinking, but it's illogical. It can't be true. support supported yeah. by the facts. The fact that we exist is a good thing. It's better to exist than to not exist. So right off the bat, that's at least one positive. So nothing can be 100% bad. Right. Even if we're suffering, we still exist. Right. Right. So there's right. always a chance at redemption. There's always hope. Yep. So you don't want to make a situation 100% bad. You always stay positive. Even if you get automatic negative thoughts, like don't judge yourself by your negative thoughts. Everyone is going to automatically have some negative thoughts. That doesn't mean you're a negative thinker. It's what do you do with that negative thought? Do you proceed down that road or do you push through it? And just noticing it is the first thing. That's right. Being no, able to that's bingo. Notice it. There's this book. I'm, I'm in the middle of it now. It's called it's like 21 Days to a Complaint Free World. It's um, awesome. I actually have it here. It's a complaint-free world. And it was started by this, this, um, he was a, what, in Catholicism, a priest, and what's the equivalent in non-Catholicism? Just like a preacher? Um, I don't know if there'd be pastor. a... Pastor. Thank you. Pastor. Yeah. So this pastor started this at his church where he wanted to go 21 days without complaining. And he realized it's really hard. And so what he did yeah. is he got these rubber bracelets, like the Live Strong ones. Yeah. And anytime you complain, you switch the bracelet to the other hand. 
and he you just realize one how much we complain but two how much of your friends are complainers or they're not right, right. so i was in the uber the other morning flying to new york mm-hmm. and this lady the whole time was just it was not one positive thing the whole time it was complaining about her iphone battery actually which was just you know, kill me um but it's just interesting because complaining is a form of self-talk and it kind of goes into what you were saying and i think the other thing that really brings us home is the notion of gratitude yeah being grateful for anything that happens yeah. Right. Um, do you guys talk about that? In your all, the, program? all the time. So that the opposite of depression is actually not happiness. That's what, something I learned in psychology, which, okay. is, which I was like, what? If you're not sad, you're happy, right? No, you're grateful. Okay. Right. So the, the opposite, that's why psychologists will say for people who are battling with de- depression, making a gratitude list. Mm. And this is nothing new. Like, but when you say your prayers, the first thing you should start with is thanks. Right. Right. And then, and then also they'll say like, write, psychologists will say, write a letter to someone who's helped you in the past, thanking them for the help and then give that letter to the person. So we talk about gratitude all the time. Like that's okay. such an, that's such an important thing. You know, many of the Psalms have to do with gratitude, right? Thanksgiving. So that that becomes really important we constantly focus on that okay. and that's our first principle we have four principles of wrestling mindset we do with our teams that's our first one i'm thankful for the opportunity to wrestle okay. if you're not a wrestler i'm thankful for the opportunity to compete yep i'm thankful for the opportunity to do a podcast yep. to run a business etc cetera, etc cetera. what are the other three so, oh t- two is i'm aggressive and relentless okay three is i have no fear of losing or making mistakes and four is i never ever give up so we have our teams do this before and after every practice, and we recommend they do this before any lift. You get together as a team. You get up on your feet, just like a martial arts dojo, just like the military. I love that just, about the dojos. Yeah. yeah. When you go to jujitsu, they take it very seriously. They you, do. You, you don't. You don't even allow to step on the mat until you've given your your graces or whatever it is. You bow, and I think. There's something that's a little corny about that, but there's something to be said for it that I think wrestling could take. Your code well. is first. Right. And that's exactly when, – when I saw that uh, and I started thinking about it, why are we not doing that? And I and you level with the kids. Like, look, I get it. This is going to feel a little weird. It's going to feel corny because you haven't done it before. But this is what the military does. This is what – you study the successful people. I love history yeah. for that reason. You study the military. You study um, the, the um, martial arts dojos. And even at church, I thought on Sundays, what do we do? We stand up and we profess the creed. What do we believe? Who are we? What are we about? Right. And that's why people – Know, when they know who they are, they're willing to die for it. You're bulletproof. So gratitude is real important, and knowing those um, those different principles. Okay. So what do we say? I'm thankful for the opportunity to compete. I'm aggressive and relentless. I have no fear of losing or making mistakes. I never ever give up. You stand up as a group. You say it out loud. So now you're having the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. It becomes our principles. Yeah. And then it be- you get mental reps, just like you have reps for strength training, reps for technique training. Yes. Now you have your technique for your uh, mental reps, right. right? Over and over, and you're saying this. And we had two NCAA champions actually. Um, one DeAndre Dr- Johnson from Limestone. After he won the NCAA's, they put an interview in front of your. Uh, they put a um, microphone yeah. in front of your face, and now you're doing an interview which is sometimes more stressful than wrestling yes and autopilot he's trained and he said i just had no fear of losing or making mistakes Wow. Ben Brisman from Ithaca won the NCAA's D3 last year. Um, we worked with this team in high school, Pascac Hills in New Jersey. Okay. And when he had, the inter- he had the interview right after, I was just thankful for the opportunity to wrestle. Wow. So it's like when you drum those messages, you beat that message into their mind, just like technique, just like strength, mm-hmm. they're there. And in moments of stress, we tend to resort back to our most practiced behavior. Definitely. Which is why you want to build good habits on a regular basis. Because otherwise, when you feel that stress, you feel the pressure, you're going to revert back to old behaviors, which are often negative. Right. Right. So so you, that's why you want to practice the way you want to play. Wasn't well, it crazy so, the disparity between – to me, there's, there's three levers if we're just focusing on wrestling. Uh, conditioning and strength, technique, and then mind. If you were to look at all the hours people put into the former two – Compared to the latter, it's almost unbelievable how yeah, really, yeah. you might have put in 12,000 hours into drilling. You might yeah. have put in 500 hours or 1,000 hours, whatever it is, yeah. into running and lifting, probably more, and almost zero hours into visualization, meditation, um, positive self-talk. It's yeah. crazy. That's the first the question I ask athletes whenever I go to, and coaches whenever I go to a convention, to a club, or give a presentation. What percentage of the sport is mental and what percentage is physical? And they'll say it's like 90% mental. Yeah. Okay, how much time are you spending percentage-wise, physically versus mentally? They'll say, uh, probably 95% physical. And I say, now think about that. Like, don't run away from that. You got to be able to spot your own hypocrisy and sit with that. We have live in a generation now, it's like the buffered self, right? We just play video games, open up social media, talk to friends. Um, Netflix, we distract ourselves from those those internal conflicts. No, you need to sit with that and think. You're saying the sport is 90% mental. This it's a, it's an important thing to you. You want to be successful in wrestling. Yeah. You're saying it's 90% mental, but 
you're training 95% physical. Sit with that. What are you going to do about that? Right. You know, and then we see all those common mindset, red flags, choking, underperforming, giving good opponents too much respect, not being able to bounce back from mistakes. You keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting what you're getting, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Right. Right. Sit with that hypocrisy. And what are you going to do about that? Yeah. So that's why we wanted to bridge that gap between the physical and the mental training. And now you're actually working on that. And, we, you know, making it done in a sports specific way. We did have sports psychology in college come in but it was very like vague and it was you have to apply these principles now to your sport we said we want to serve this to wrestlers and to athletes speaking directly to their language not airy fairy right down to earth what, what do you need like yeah. all those great lessons you're talking about we talk about tim ferris yeah. tony robbins um now let's take that let's package that into wrestling and and serve that to the wrestler what does that mean for a wrestler and now what does that mean to a baseball player a volleyball player and on and on i love that so and so just to wrap things up. I deviated from the predator prey. I'm sorry about that's that. Okay. I, could, I could give you more about not thinking about other people. but <laughs> no, I, uh, no, I, I totally forgot about it. I was, just, I was enjoying the conversation, man. So I want to shift to three questions I had from, from some of my buddies. Um, one is a wrestling coach at a Division three college in Iowa. And he wants to know, what are some of the pre-match rituals you have your guys do? Okay, so we say in order to have a, a great pre-match routine, Back up a second. Why would you have a pre-match routine? Sure. You're most likely to be nervous the 15 to 20 minutes right before you step out there. Yes. Same thing with giving a speech. Yes. Same thing with doing an interview. Yes. Anything. It, asking out a pretty girl on a date. It's usually right before that, that time where, you're, where, it's the, where it's the most scary. Right. So one of the simplest ways to take control of your energy, your thought process, we go into this fight or flight mode, right? Which, which was built into us as a safety mechanism, right? Yes. So you go into that fight or flight mode, sympathetic nervous system, it's very predictable. Heart starts racing, sweaty palms, racing thoughts, we get jittery. So it's a common experience everyone has. Some people look at it as a positive, some people look at it as a negative. So we talk about that, redefining that, but you have that, you know it's gonna happen, it's okay. predictable. So what do you do in that moment? It's sometimes hard to take control of your body and sometimes hard to take control of your mind. So if you have a pattern of behaviors that you're doing, you could control your actions, right? So take control of your actions first. Okay. Those 15 to 20 minutes, you wanna make it very detailed and very specific. What exactly am I gonna be doing and what exactly am I gonna be thinking right before? Okay. It quiets your mind down because when a wrestler is warming up or right before his match, you're seeing your parents in the stands. You start thinking about your parents. We talked about other people, right? That prey mindset, what's going on around me? This kid's ranked in the country. What's my coach gonna think about me? Who's my opponent? My opponent has a real good double leg. That eyes on the side mentality, they're thinking of everything else going on around them. I want them, I want them, no, we know exactly what we're gonna tell ourselves, what we're gonna think, and the emotions we're gonna feel. So we say, for any pre-match routine, there should be four elements. Dynamic stretching, deep breathing, an element of fun, and hands-on drilling. Okay. Okay. We, but we go into those yeah. a little bit further. I love it. No, no, that's perfect. No, that's that's good to know. And it's repeatable, and you do it every time. No matter if it's a, a kid you can you know you're going to win or a kid who is a tough match. Wrestle-offs right. doesn't matter. Right. Same exact thing. Maybe even if you really want to get crazy with it, even during a practice match. You know, if you have like a Saturday simulation match, and you want to do those same things over and over. Yeah. And you think about them. Yeah, okay. my brother Greg went to the um, Olympic Training Center to, to train uh, out there, and he saw Henry Cejudo after he won the Olympics. So he was done wrestling at this time, Yeah, and he would do, was doing a practice match. He was full-on getting ready to wrestle, like going through a full pre-match routine. And we said, man, that's why he is who he is, because yeah. he treats practice the same way as he treats matches. You don't want to distinguish. It's just live wrestling. It's all the same. Yeah. You know, in practice, usually we tell ourselves this doesn't count, this doesn't mean anything. And then in matches, it's this is it, do or die, make it or break it, there is no tomorrow. Yeah. You want to treat them exactly the same and do the same things. So we also tell our coaches, be careful the music the kids are listening to. Okay. In high school, I would listen to, I'd think I have to listen to Eminem or Rocky or Tupac, get myself real fired up yeah and i was just making myself more and more nervous right. and once i learned more about like the mindset and how we could apply it to wrestling i started listening to songs that would make me laugh alvin and the chipmunks disco christmas yeah. songs backstreet boys nsync don't yes. take myself serious and and then when i would do that then i'd wrestle a lot better in matches so careful the music you're putting into your mind knowing your personal energy level because it's almost a yeah. you want to go into the match like a zen buddhist monk in many ways like you don't want to be I used to be all fired up and like angry or you, you want to be intense, but I don't think you want to be angry or too high or too low. I think you, what it, you have to, each person has to find that. But yeah. for me, it was um, that Zen type of mindset. Then I, I read yeah. this book that Michael Chandler recommended. It's called Mind Gym. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. And they, in one chapter, yeah. they talk about 
the elite performers all have a, a mental score of where their their optimal performance is. So like a 10 is you're redlining, you're freaking out, you're sweating, you, you're not calm at all, yeah. right? A one is you're too low energy, you're not focused. So every elite performer knows, hey, my optimal performance, I'm at like a 7.8. Right, I'm just high enough where I'm focused, but I'm not nervous yet. And I've used right. this a lot for my business meetings where I'll be in the lobby, the 10 minutes yeah. before the meeting starts, and it's starting to get real. Yeah. Right? I, I've yeah. checked in, the guy's coming to get me in about 10 minutes, and I'm starting to get nervous. So I'm thinking, man, I'm like a 9.1 right now. I gotta bring it down to a, like a 7.8. You know? So that's yeah. something that kind of goes hand in hand with that music. You know, Don't let it get in your head too much. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta know your optimal point. It's gotta be done well in advance. Most people just leave it to chance and then the day that and then the day of the match, they just kind of try to throw it together right. and it can't be done like that. So like the second lesson we have wrestlers do, or maybe the third lesson, uh, or all of our athletes, write down your three best performances on one paper, yep. write down your three worst performances on another paper. Now notice I didn't say three biggest wins, three biggest losses. The performance doesn't have to do with the win or the loss. Yep. When did you think you were bringing out your best? When do you think you competed at your worst? Now write down exactly what you were thinking, feeling, feeling and doing before and during those competitions. Okay. Before and during, what were you telling yourself? What were you doing? What kind of music were you listening to? On a scale of one to 10, what was your energy level like? Right. And what you're trying to do is trying to find the underlying theme. What's the pattern? What's the thread between these matches? Do the same exact thing with your worst performances. Yep. What were you thinking, feeling, doing, listening to right before you went out there and compete? Got it. And invariably, we've done this with tens and thousands of athletes, not just me, but our whole program yeah. around the country across sports and we find that if you look at those two different papers side by side it's completely different mindsets yep. so what does that tell you your performance is almost entirely mental yes of course you have to train hard of course we're not downplaying that for one That's second of course but <laughs> you're looking at your best and your worst performances stark contrast in your mindset well there it is right there so the key to success is do more of what works do less of what doesn't work but now you have it in front of you and unfortunately a lot of times like the sports psychology is more becomes more like what I didn't like about it, it was more motivational speaking or pep talks and it was very like abstract and theoretical and we're like no here's the worksheet fill this out right. here's the other worksheet fill this out now compare the two the reason why we get into sports is because we're hands-on people we're practical we want to touch it taste it smell it yep. we live in our senses yeah most wrestlers are not really abstract and theoretical people no. so you have to make it more down to earth and practical and that was another thing like when we would see a lot of times unfortunately at sports psychologists they would come in they would talk to the team right away about goal setting which is in theoretically, it sounds like a good idea. Start with goal setting, right? The downside is I remember in college, our entire team was ranked in the country. We had a two-time NCAA champ. We had an All-American. Everyone had high goals. So when he came in, we're like, why are we doing this? Like, we're getting nervous right before our matches. What should we be thinking? What should we be telling ourselves? So we just take a much more practical approach, like starting exactly with what the athletes need. Look, we know you're struggling with these areas, and here's what we could do to help you with this today. Yeah. And other things we saw sometimes like um, visualization se sequences where um, coaches would lay the kids down on the mat, cut the lights. And I get it. Like, I love goal setting and I yeah. love visualization, but not the first time or even the second time or third time. This is your one chance to rope kids in to the importance of mindset. And you're blowing it because you're focusing on goals, which is they just kind of brush off. Oh, we're setting goals, we're writing down goals, whatever. Yeah. Or visualization. They shut off the lights. The coach takes them through. Kids are laughing, falling asleep, not taking it serious. You start with, look. These are the mindset red flags. This is what you're struggling with, and this is what you could do right now. Yeah, like it's practical, it's tangible, and it's specific to your sport. So I, I just think that. that's that, that's like a big thing that we try to do to set us apart. Okay, so it was what I needed, what I would have wanted. Practical, you know? hands-on stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I know I said a couple more, but I know we're getting short on time. So we'll just wrap it up here. It's one last question. I asked this to uh, to everybody, and that's if you had to summarize in a couple words how the sport changed your life, or if you had a parent that comes up to you and says, "Why should my kid wrestle?" How would you respond to that? Like, what are some of the life lessons that you think it teaches? Again, just the fact that it is a vehicle to improve your life. It's, 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 so, there's so many lessons in this sport and it really requires a full out effort physically, mentally, emotionally. Like the fact that you have to work, it's the, the, the hardest sport in the world. There's a weight element where now you got to, you know, you're eating it just the, the training, the year round dedication. It's just, you start asking yourself, yeah, it actually re requires you to ask yourself big questions. Why am I doing this? Who am I? And those searching questions can lead to bigger can lead to bigger answers. Like I think there's a reason why faith is an important part of the wrestling community. A lot of coaches talk about faith. Yeah. There's Bible studies in, in wrestling. The people are talking about Jesus in Tom wrestling. Ryan's big on it. And, and yeah, a lot of coaches yeah. are. And it's not a surprise, I think, because what's happening is you're you're pushing yourself so hard. It's it's taxing every aspect of the person that you ask yourself, who am I? 
why am I doing this? And that will lead you to bigger answers. And if wrestling is used the right way, then, you know, you're going to be healthy your whole life. You're running Spartan races now, right? right? So it's like, and then, you know, me doing different types of training. It's like, you should be in shape when your career is over. You should be using those connections that you've made now for your businesses and everything in the future. Yes. So it taxes you so much and it makes you ask those ultimate questions in life. Whereas if you're doing something easier, you might not ask as searching of questions. And I think that's why you want to see the bigger, the bigger picture. And then once you have that component down with like, with your faith, knowing who you are, knowing what you believe. And because you've had to stubbornly persist despite opposition when you get knocked down you bounce right back up wrestling teaches you how to get back up when you get knocked down i think there's no lonelier moment than the monday after a state tournament and you go i just spent four months and i didn't get what i wanted at the time i was short-sighted but having that self-reflection and self-awareness is huge and you really get that in wrestling which you is know. very different than other sports because it's just you and the other person. It's the closest thing to a legal fight that a, that a, kid, can, that a kid can do in middle school or high school. Right. It's a legal fight. There's nowhere to run, no one to hide, no one to blame. Right. And for a kid to have to deal with that, as far as not making excuses, putting the onus on themselves, and trying to find those answers, it's huge. And I, we do have a little bit more time than I thought. So one more that I know my buddy wanted me to ask is, how does someone um, get to work involved get involved with your program are you hiring and what does that process look like i'd love to so as 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 we expand yeah like we've we've mindset coaches we have people who do sales with us we have people who do okay. marketing so yeah we'd be happy to just you know if they you put them in touch reach with out. us they okay. could read they could reach out our numbers on the website they could fill out our contact form and just fill it inside the box with that but yeah we're looking to expand and really oh. The big thing is with the business, we need people who are really looking at this as a calling and as a vocation because we I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't really feel like God wanted me to be doing this. And I tell the people that work with us too that if you really don't feel like you're called to do this, do something else because not not in like an arrogant way by any stretch, like do work where you think that you you should be. Like where does God want you to be? Do that. Yeah. So it's it's you want to be passionate about it and also just like wrestling, you know, you have you you, you want to be able to control your destiny and not be slowed down by other people. If you of people that are passionate about the same thing they believe it's their vocation everyone's going to work harder and everyone's going to have a better time but you've some people who, who take it as a passion and it's their vocation other people it's just a part-time gig like it's not that big of a deal yeah they want to do other things like then really not, not right. we're not on the same page and it's nothing personal yeah, yeah. so well, it's a it's an it's a um I'm trying to think of the best way to put this it's an impactful job because you the kid's trusting you and yeah. if you don't take it seriously that could be you know it could be a terrible experience for them. Not that that's ever happened, yeah. but if, to your point, you know, take yeah. it seriously if you're going to do it. Last yeah. thing is, sure. where can a parent or a coach find you? How do they sign up for the services? H- how does that work if someone wants to work with you guys? Obviously, go yeah. to the website, but yeah. maybe talk about the services you guys have. Yeah, wrestlingmindset.com or zwinningmindset.com. Same thing just for all, for all sports. Uh, we have an individual program. We have a team program. We have different options. So depending on, you know, the, the amount is based on how many workshops we're doing. Yep. Obviously, the more the better, but it's better to do something rather than nothing, of course. Yeah. So really, like we said, just taking the bull by the horns and not leaving it to chance. The problem is most people leave it to chance. And like we said with our careers, you want to look back and say, I did everything that I possibly could to reach my goals, right? I left no stone unturned. I maximized my, my potential. So at the end of the day, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. But I know I didn't leave any stone unturned. Mm-hmm. So that's why, that's why it's so big and so important to do. You know, you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting what you're getting. And I really believe that that in sports, school, in your life, It's your mindset that makes the difference. Amen. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ryan. That's the end of this episode, but definitely not the end of the show. For more episodes, please go to wrestlingchangemylife.org. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a star rating. Show the love, baby. Show the love. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. Peace.